Okay, again, some announcement uh, just to begin with, right? So the office hour today will be a little bit shorter. Um, so basically, uh, sorry, let me just do it again. Okay, sorry, my pencil is not really writing. Okay, there we go. Uh, for the office hour today, it will be a little bit shorter. It will just be from three to four. Okay. But if you got questions, you can uh, make an appointment or just drop by Friday. I'll be there on Friday for lab session. Okay, just about lab zero. You should have done that already, but I just want to mention one more thing. If you're struggling still with the basic syntax of iPhone, I will highly recommend you actually go over this tutorial video series. Okay, how can you find it? Basically, you go to the lectures page. Okay, let me show you very quickly in case you haven't found it. Okay, if you go to the lectures page for section M, and then you will see the ver the second one, use uh, the use of iPhone Studio for DBC and TDD. Okay, that definitely cover all the basic syntax you should know. For lab number one, we cannot really cover everything you would you should know about lab one to in the lecture because lab one requires some knowledge about a graph algorithm. That's something we assume you, uh, that's already covered in the previous course. But if you got trouble, you can speak to me. But I would say, as far as the programming language is concerned, if you can follow through this video, then you're ready. If you haven't, not too late yet. You better start. Okay. Okay. Next one. Uh, how can you find the due dates? Uh, some of you actually was uh, were asking me about the question. For example. If you want to find out the due dates for individual labs or the projects, this is where you should go. Okay, let me just show you again. So go to the course wiki site, uh, assuming that you're enrolled or you already sent me an email to get access. Once you log in to the course wiki, there is a tab over here called dates and grades. If you go there, you will actually see the due dates over here. For example, lab number one, it will be due on the 21st of January. Okay, it will be strict, okay? Just uh, for your information. And uh, one thing to just remind uh, quickly, so we do do plagiarism check on every lab and also the projects, meaning that it is, okay, let me put it this way. It would be okay for you to discuss only at a very high and abstract level uh, about the labs with your classmate. That's actually acceptable. However, what you shouldn't do is to really end up having code that's suspiciously similar, which means you should never talk about how you are supposed to implement the functions or the classes, okay? Just be careful, because we do check for similarity between the uh, uh, submissions, because every lab uh, is supposed to be individual work, unless otherwise specified. Okay, question. Is it, are you sure that's earlier? You know what, let me look into this. Okay, maybe there's uh, some missing information. Let me look at that. Okay, don't worry, okay. Yeah? I think that's the 2018, 2019 thing. Did I actually go to, oh, uh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, good. If I may, you're right. Sorry about that. Sorry for the panic I just caused. All right, there we go. Now you're happy. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, go to the course wiki. Make sure you go to 2019, 20 version, right? Okay, sorry for the panic. Alrighty. Okay, and then uh, for this Friday, uh, I'm actually going to do some demo on my computer just to give guide you through some useful syntax for doing uh, not just lab one, but also for all the subsequent labs. I'll do it around 10.30. If you belong to maybe the 11.30 lab, feel free to come earlier. I'll record it anyway. But if you want to come, the advantage will be you can ask me questions. Okay, this Friday. Okay, I'll try to do um, maybe every Friday or every second, fr uh, second Friday to give you some useful guidance on the, uh, on the course. Okay, Any anyway, just show up. Okay, let's continue with this exercise over here. I just want to introduce you to some very useful syntax for this course. Okay, you're gonna use it throughout the course. What I will do today, I will only program on the paper. 
but we, I'm going to show you how you can do it in Apple Studio on Friday. Okay, but at least get the concept straight first. Okay, again, the same example. Let me just bring you to up to speed, what we talked about on Monday. Basically, we have a feature or command called change at. We're taking an array of string and also some index i and also some new string. Okay, let me just give you a very concrete example. Let's say if input a is now pointing to an array of size just three, and then the first element is pointing to Alan, and the second element is pointing to Mark, and the third element is pointing to Tom. What is the expected behavior? The expected behavior, for example, if I say change at, and then I pass a by reference, and then, oh, by the way, so for iPhone arrays, by default, it start indices with one, as opposed to zero, just to um, inform you about it. So that'd be one, two, let me just make a different color here, so that'd be more obvious to you. One, two, and three. And then I have over here, uh, and then let's say I want to change at index two, and I want to change the element over there to be Jim, for example. Okay, so now, after this particular command call, or the feature call, okay, what I really expect to see is to say at index two, rather than pointing to Mark, I'm, I wanted to point to maybe Jim. Okay, that's what I want to see. That's the expected behavior. However, the reason that we want to have contracts, including pre and post condition, is to make sure the caller, the clients, is doing their obligation. Also, the colleague, the supplier, is also fulfilling the obligation. So that's why we want to see it. Okay? This would be a very typical pattern you will see uh, throughout the course, especially the post-condition. Let me just remind you, for the precondition, for the require, we just want to make sure i is indeed valid. Right? So what you can say is, you can say 1 less than or equal to i, and i is less than or equal to a.count. Think about a.count is like a.length in Java. Okay, that's about it. And then for the ensure, we came up with one post condition last time. Let me just, uh, review very quickly, okay, and see what the issue might be. Let's say over here, the, for the first post condition, I would say item at i changed. As we said before, before each post condition, you'll be advisable. You will be advised that you actually put a tag just for tracing the bug, okay. So now, this will be very easy. I will simply say a at position i now should be equal to, okay, it's using tilde for equals, right? Like a object equality comparing the contents. Will be the same as ns, because now in ns will be just Jim. Okay, that's the uh, first post condition we achieved together on Monday. So now, what would be the problem here, really? Okay, what I, one problematic scenario I mentioned on Monday was as follows, okay? If this, this, the, this is the only post condition you have, let's say number one, okay? What if the supplier is really crazy? So let's say, somehow they, not only that they're gonna modify uh, index two to be Jin, they always modify the next index or the last one to be, for example, uh, maybe just junk. Apparently, we know there's something wrong over here for the supplier. However, is the current contracts or the post condition going to catch that? It's not. Okay, let's understand that first. Because if you run it, the only post condition you will check will be item at index i has been changed. You only check to see if this part over here has been changed properly. Indeed, it has been changed to Jim, so that's not a problem. However, there's no where in the post condition that will check everything else outside the uh, i, right? That's the problem, okay? That's where we uh, ended with on Monday. So now here's a question. How are we supposed to write other post condition to cover that? Conceptually thinking this way, if you want to modify something into the data structure, at least two things you want to consider. Number one, think about what should be changed. That's basically already covered. Number two, what about everything else in the data structure? They should remain untouched. That's what's missing, okay? Okay, so now for number two, before I introduce to you the syntax in iPhone, which I really want to do. 
But let's uh, also review what you learned from 1090, right? So now, how am I supposed to actually do over here for post condition number two? Let me just write a tag name informally. I would say others, which means everything else uh, other than uh, index i. Others unchanged. How should I put it? Put it in practical logic, that's fine. And what I said on Monday was you can think about either using for all or you can using there exists. They can be shown to equivalent to each other back in 1090. But I would say in this case, it might be easier, more convenient to use for all to begin with. Right? Okay. Anybody want to suggest something here for me? How can I use for all? To basically say, I want to make sure everything other than an index i, they will have their value untouched by the supplier. Yes. Okay, that was just uh, okay, one moment. If I say for all, okay, so, okay, how about, okay, let me guide you through a little bit. You want to say for every other index, right? Apparently, we already used the variable i. To avoid confusion, let's introduce a variable called j. Okay. Let's say for every j, such that, so what should be the range for j? Okay, sure. So let's say this. For every j, such that, let's say 1 is less than or equal to j, and also j is less than or equal to a dot count. It's basically saying j should be also a valid index, right? And also j is not equal to i. Let's say, okay, sure. And also j is not equal to i. And then it should be the case. A, conceptually, aj should be the same as the old version of aj. So this is correct. Guys, any question about this practical logic here? If you got any question, it's now time to ask. I guarantee this kind of pattern is going to appear quite a lot. So it's good to ask questions right now. Oh, it's just about notation. When I do for all, you can think about this is just notation I will use in class. When I say for every, maybe some dummy variable x, okay? And then I would say, this is such that. And then I will give you some range to say what should be the range for x. x may be from 1 to 10, maybe from minus 5 to minus 2, something like that. And then the bullet point here simply means it is the case. I'm saying for those x that satisfy the range constraint, they must satisfy this particular property. One example, for every x, such that 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 5, it is the case. Let's say x squared larger than or equal to 25. Right? Would that be true or false? False? If you believe that's false, can you give me one counter example? Well, when, when x is 1, right? Okay, easy, right? Okay, this is apparently false because when x is equal to 1, for example, that one larger than or equal to 25 is simply false. Okay. Yeah? Can you go back to the other one? Uh, you mean the, the one we just did? Yeah. yeah. Um, so how do we check, like we, we did the, the statement to see if it's not changed. Like how does that ignore the one that we want to change? So over here you can see, okay. So I think uh, what your colleague just said is very important. We, first of all, we say for every j, and we give two constraints to the range of j. First of all, j should be a valid index. So this means valid index. And it's a conjunction. That means at the same time, j must not equal to the i we want to change at, right? So not the position to change. Yes, question about this. Can we do 
You mean maybe from one, one until i minus one, and then i plus one until a dot count. That's also fine. Okay, let me just write it down. Okay, it's very good, very good. He definitely can do it. Another way to write it, I'll write it down here. Okay, another way to say it would be for every j such that one less than or equal to j less than or equal to i minus one, not including i for sure. Or let's say, um, let's say over here i plus one less than or equal to uh, j and then less than or equal to a dot count. It is the case, a j would be the O value of a j. Okay, that's also fine. You can definitely do it. I'm just talking about math before we turn, turn to a form that's easier to translate to programming. Yes? Is the dot similar to an Oh, the dot over here, yes. It's basically imprecation, right? Okay, again, it's a quick review of math, right? Back in 1090, if you say for every x such that rx range, it is the case, some property p, right? That's general form. That one there is simply equivalent to for every x, let's say we ignore the range. We want to combine them. So you will simply say, given that rx is true, implies p of x is the case, right? That's what you learned in 1090. Just want to confirm. Okay, so now my question is, do you have any concern about the two predicates I wrote down? Is it clear to you? Yes. Oh, over here. I'm basically saying over here, well, I'm basically talking about two possible ranges, right? I'm saying that uh, if you think about this is the array, and this is the i that we want to change, right? We are saying that when I talk about this j over here, it could be either between 1 and i minus 1. Or it could be between i plus 1 and the a dot count, either one. It would be wrong, you can think about why. It would be wrong if I say conjunction over here. Because there's no such j that will actually satisfy these two non-overlapping ranges at the same time. Think about it, okay? So guys, my point is, this guy here must be a disjunction. If you actually put conjunction over here, it's actually wrong. Think about why, okay? Any questions? Yes? Yes, the same. Yeah, I'm just saying for this, uh, okay, you're basically talking about this guy here. When I talk about this guy here, apparently you can see I am, I am omitting the vertical bar. Vertical bar usually is for you to specify the range. So now I'm just combining the range and property together using uh, imprecation. Right. Okay. okay, now, what you have just said is pretty good, but I would like to suggest another pattern that's gonna be maybe easier for you to translate into Eiffel syntax eventually, okay? It's basically the same idea, okay? Let me write it down over here. Let's say, again, we have this particular array over here, okay? And then this is the index i that we intend to change, right? And somehow we want to say these two ranges should remain there, values untouched, in the pre-states to the post-states, okay? Now, let's say I have a constraint on you. I want to say the following. For every j such that one less than or equal to j, less than or equal to a dot count. Okay, again, this is a, and don't forget, this is one, and this is a dot count, right? Let's say for this part here, that's it. I don't want the range to be too detailed. All I say is j is gonna be a valid index. I don't really want to say j may not be able to, uh, j may not be i, or it may be i. I don't want to do the distinction over here, okay? So now my question is, what should I put over here in the property? Okay, hold on. Guys, think about it, it's really important. So now, in the property part, j may be i, or it may not be i. You want to write a single Boolean predicate such that 
is going to say, when it is equal to i, I don't care, because it's already handled by the previous post condition. When it is not equal to i, I do care. I want to make sure the old value remains the same. <coughs> yep, so be careful. When you say if, it's more like a programming notation, right? Is that more, more like a programming? I, I know what you want to say. You want to say something like if, oh, I'll just let me write the syntax. It's not exactly correct. Maybe imprecation, yes. Let me just write, write it down. Conceptually, you want to say if uh, j is equal to i, and then in this case, we don't actually care, right? Because it's already handled. In that case, it will just be true, which means we don't have to falsify the whole expression over here. Otherwise, when j is not equal to i, in that case, we want to make sure a j is the same as old a j. This is not exactly uh, right, but conceptually it is. Okay? Are you okay with this? Okay, so now, just go one step further. I have two options for you. Okay? This is how you can think of it. So what I will do is, I'm just going to uh, move this guy here away, put it here. I have two options for you. Okay? In here, I can either say, number one, j not equal to i and a j old a j number one okay number two j not equal to i because that's the one I want I care implies you know what? let me be uh, mathematical so here the end should be conjunction okay implies a j the same as old AJ. Basically, one and two are basically identical, except that one is using conjunction, the other one is using imprecation, right? It's a common mistake as well. That's why I want to talk about it. The green one is basically conceptually how you can think about, right? Because we only care about those J in the orange area. We only care about the J that's in either this area or this area. When j is actually equal to i, we simply don't care. It's already covered by this particular post condition that we did on Monday. Okay, just to get it clear. Okay, so now, should one work or should two work? Both or neither? Two? Okay, implication? Okay, I more care about if you can justify why one is wrong. Jordan? Exactly, exactly true, okay. Guys, understanding why one is wrong is very, very crucial. Okay, let me just talk about it very quickly, okay. Apparently, one is going to be wrong, okay. This is not correct, okay. This whole thing here is not correct. Not correct. And on the other hand, number two over here is the way to go. Okay, let's see why. Okay, I'm going to explain just about one over here. For one over here, think about how the for all is going to be somehow evaluated on this uh, array. If I'm currently looking at this particular position over here, let's, let's, let's say that's j. j not equal to i would be true. Agree? Okay, in that case, that'll be true. And then all we're going to check is to make sure the old value and the new value for this particular position has not been touched. Right? That's correct. Let's see another case. If I'm currently, I have done all these checks already. Let's say if currently I'm here. Let's say this is the current value for j. In that case, j not equal to i would be false. Agree? In this case, j not equal to i would just be false. And tell me something. If I know one side of the conjunction is already false, in that case, oh, everything will be false, right? So that means we are checking something that's unnecessary for this particular post condition. So that's why conjunction should not be used. How, how can the implication help? If you think about it, let's say we go for version number two and then we try the implication. When we reach this particular guy over here, oh, oh actually, let me just talk about two cases. 
Let's say now I'm talking about this particular version over here, right? This version here with the imprecation. Let's talk about two cases, okay? Over here, when we, I talk about a case where, let's say this is one of the cases, right? J is not really equal to I. When J is not equal to I, so that means I got true already for the antecedents. In that case, whether the whole thing is going to be true depends on whether this consequence will be true. So that's correct because we've got to check it to make sure the old value is the same as the new value. So that one is fine. But what about this problematic case over here? So let's say if I'm talking, talking about currently j is not equal to i. So that means antecedent will just be false. When the antecedent is false, does it really matter what the consequence is for the implication? Does it matter? The whole thing will just be true. So that means we're ignoring that for the universal quantification. Okay? The explanation is rather long, but I think it's really important for you to get it, right? Because accidentally, if you put conjunction whereas you should put implication, then you'll be in trouble, right? And that's also very, uh, a very uh, valid exam question we might ask you to explain. Why here you should really use uh, implication as opposed to conjunction, right? Question. No, think about this. Implication will allow you to ignore certain cases when the antecedent is already false. But for conjunction, no, you have to consider every case. Every case must be exactly true. That's the thing, right? No, so for here, we are still talking about predicate logic. Okay? Yeah, okay. Let's now just get a very clean page and let me rewrite it and see how we can turn that into Eiffel. It's incredibly straightforward. That's why, again, Eiffel is a good language for specifying design. Okay? Let me just write down the final version we have. Okay? So what I would do is I'll, clean, I'll just copy this guy here and then let's start from there. So now we talk about post condition, right? Again, that's the method, we uh, the command we are talking about. We already got number one, uh, a, um, okay, let me just write it down quickly. Okay, uh, it's uh, item at i changed. A, J, uh, sorry, A, I is now equal to new string. Okay, that's what we talk about. And number two, what we're talking about is others unchanged. Okay, as, as we agree, I'm gonna write it down over here, for every j such that 1 less than or equal to j less than or equal to a dot count. Okay, so the range part is very straightforward, just any index that's valid. It is the case. j not equal to i implies aj unchanged, the old value of aj. O is a keyword, okay? Okay, that's what we said. So now, how can we translate it to Eiffel? Okay, I'll show you the syntax quickly. It's incredibly easy. Every time, if you have to deal with um, universal quantification, you can use the across syntax. You may have seen that already in lab zero and lab one, okay? I'll just start, start you with that. Across is a keyword, okay? I'll do this uh, hands-on, some hands-on programming e example on Friday together with you, but let's get a concept straight first. Across, and now I wanna say J should be between one and A dot count, right? So lower bound is one, and then upper bound is A dot count. I should put something over here to tell the compiler, so the, way, the thing I should put over here is this. Vertical bar, dot, dot, vertical bar. It's the syntax you have to obey. Can you do a single dot? No. Can you omit vertical bar? No. You gotta be exactly this, okay? And then after this, you can say is. That's also a keyword. I'm trying to, I'm trying to bound, basically, this range to a particular variable. Let's say I don't want to be consistent, so now I can say j. Okay? So now we are talking about, basically, for all. In that case, just put all. Ah, okay. 
for those of you, well, I should, uh, okay. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with uh, the previous version of iPhone Studio, there is another alternative uh, with using the keyword S, but now it's a better alternative to this. Okay. I'll show you both on Friday, but if I show you now, it might, be, it might get confused, but just learn this version for now. Okay, I'll explain the difference. There are actually two alternatives you can use. Okay. Okay, so now basically what is going to happen is J is now going to be any of the value between one and eight account. Okay, each one, uh, you can think about each iteration. Using the keyword all is going to make sure we're going to check for every possible value for J and eventually going to return either true or false. Okay, let me just finish that and then uh, all and end. So now we should put this guy here as a body of the across loop. Then I will say the following, I will say J not equal to i, right? Slash equal, not equal to i. So now, how do I do imprecation? Just implies. Questions? Well, why are we using the equal sign? Oh, okay, there. Just give me one moment. Okay, I'll talk about this equal sign. You just give me. Uh, let me finish that, and then I'll explain that. Implies over here. Okay, that's a keyword again. Okay, basically, you can use a and uh, you can uh, you can use a and d for conjunction. You can use or for disjunction. You can also use implies for um, implication. You can also use equal for if and only if. Okay, so these are syntax. But check out the slide 2.1 for common iPhone syntax. It's there. Okay. Implies over here, a j tilde old a j. Now you can see what I meant by being incredibly straightforward to translate it. So that's why I want to explain the math first before, and the syntax is actually trivial. Just learn it. Okay. And now, one of the questions was um, over here. Why am I using equal over here, whereas I use the tell that over here? Okay. Um, we're going to talk about something called expanded type later in the course. But thinking this way, I'll tell you uh, in the Java sense. Okay. You can think about what's the type for J and I. Integers. Integers are primitive. In which case, you just want to compare primitive. Remember in Java, when you want to compare primitive, you just say equals, equals, right? Just compare their contents. In that case, you can just use equal. It would be OK if you just say not tell that. That's also going to work. Okay? And then you tell that over here is like the equals method in Java. So now in this case, because aj and oaj, they are of reference type, like a string. So that's why you have to use the equals method. Well, we'll tell them. Okay. Some subtleties you have to get used to. OK, that's how you do it. That's correct. So again, if you look at that over here, uh, this guy here, this is what you would do in math. And I would highly recommend think of that first, conceptually. And then the orange part over here is what you would have to write in order to make your design executable. Okay? So from blue to the orange. Yes? Oh, what's the difference? Oh, it, the question is uh, about this across. You know what? Let me delay that discussion to Friday so I can demonstrate to you. Okay, for now, all you have to know is here, the all here simply correspond to the for all. Okay, very quick uh, reminder. What if for my particular post condition, if I want to do there exists, okay? The syntax you got to write is rather than all, you're going to put some, like a some elements. I'll do example on Friday on the computer, but for now, just to get clear what this syntax is really saying. Okay, I got one more. I got one exercise for you. Okay, here. Apparently, you can see uh, the contract is basically almost there. Almost, not quite yet. Okay? I'm going to discuss it. Let's say we got number one here, and we got number two over here. One and two. Is it possible to combine them into a single one? Let me make it more clear. To really make up, uh, okay. Every time if you have ensure what require, the same idea. 
If I say ensure, okay, and then I say post condition one, post condition two at the runtime, and post condition three all the way to, you know, for, for however many post conditions you might have. At the runtime, it's gonna check one and two and three. Put them together in conjunction, okay? Of course, one way for you to uh, do it in the previous one will be, you can say to put into a single post condition, you can say A uh, I is new string. And you will do the across loop I just talked about, right? That will be a single post condition, but that's not what I'm meant to ask. Okay, that's one way to combine it into a single post condition, just a conjunction, right? This is my question. Is it possible to combine these two things together into a single for all? Is it possible? Yeah, somehow you want to do some case analysis, right? Okay, what about I just present you the math? Okay, guys, uh, try to follow through this story here. Eventually, we ended up having these two. I just want to present you a different alternative. Apparently, a single for all, as opposed to split them into one and two, uh, is possible. Okay, let's have a single for all, okay? And that will actually be a quite nice pattern for you to see, okay? So I'll do the following, okay? I can say for all, again, j such that one less than or equal to j, less than or equal to a dot count, it is the case, okay? So now I wanna say there are two cases for j, right? Either, let me remind you again, this is the array I have, and this is i. I wanna say either j is in this range or in this range, either that, or j is this guy here, either blue or pink. I want to put it into the same for all. Is it possible? Let me start you with, okay? If i is equal to j, okay? If i is equal to j, something should happen. If i is not equal to j, something else should be expected, right? Well. Now it should be quite obvious to you, I hope. When i is equal to j, so that means a at position j should be equal to the new string. When i is not equal to j, so that means aj should be the same as the old version of aj. We are just one step away from there. Apparently, you can see the body of the for loop, uh, for the body for the universal quantification here, I got two predicates, which is not allowed. How do I combine them together? Conjunction, yes, exactly, right? I wanna say both cases should be covered, okay? Think about this math, this is a final form, okay? For this final form here, this is your exercise. Your exercise, you can already do it. Exercise, translate to iPhone. That's your exercise, okay? Okay, any question before I mention one more issue about the post conditions we have so far? Okay. Okay, let me now go back here, and then if you bear with me, let me just tell you the one more issue that we should really cover, okay? What we have so far is pretty good, but it's not quite there yet. Okay, again, it's here. Let me just write it down very quickly, okay? Number one, let me just split them into two parts, okay? Just uh, version one. A at, position J, uh, A at position I is the same as new string. Number two, across one until A dot count is J. And then I will do uh, I is not equal to J implies aj the same as old aj. Okay, these are the two post conditions. Question for you, is it possible to still have an evil supplier who does something crazy but will not be caught by this particular post conditions? Can you think of any other scenario? Huh? 
Huh? Change the name of the array? No, you just stick to the object there, right? Oh, change the, the name or the length? The length. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah, that's the issue here. Question for you. Let's say this. If, think about this is the old version of A. The old version, okay? Old version of A, conception. We'll talk about exactly what I meant by old, et cetera. It, has to, it will take another lecture, but we'll, we'll talk about it next time. Okay? But now, let's say this. For the old, uh, old A, let's say over here, we got Alan here, we got Mark here, we got Tom here, okay? And then, let's say after saying change at, okay, something. And then, this crazy supplier is doing the following, right? You will definitely do the corresponding change you, you want. However, at the same time, it's going to grow the array by size one. So now you can see there's a difference between the size of the two versions of the array, right? You can see the new version of the array is of size four. There's a new version of the A. Okay, of size one, uh, one, two, three, and four. The old version has only three. Okay, so now when we try to run this particular cross loop, what would be the value for a dot count? A here is talking about the current version of a in the post states. What would be a dot count? Four, right? One here, two here, three here, and four here. A dot count would just be four. And do you think we might run into any trouble when we try to somehow compare old version of A using from one to four? We will, right? Because over here, when you talk about the old version of A, old version of A, and then at position, for example, four, in this case, you don't have that. So you'll get some, something like, like an index out of bound exception in Java. But it's called index, maybe uh, invalid index. A counter violation. So that's another issue for this post condition. How can we handle this? Hmm? Well, should be as easy as why don't you just as make sure before you run that particular number two across, why don't you make sure the two arrays have the same size exactly? Okay, good. So now one more post condition to check. And I will suggest something. You tell me if that's appropriate or not. Okay. If I simply add number three over here, I say a dot count. Sorry, let me write it properly. If I say a dot count equal, okay, primitive type, so we can use equal sign. That's not a problem. Oh, one moment. Okay. Old a dot count. The old version of the, okay, apparently you can see a dot count is four. O a dot count is three. They are not equal. Since like we will get a post condition violation, it seems like. But am I doing that appropriately? I heard no. Is that maybe what you want to suggest it? What you wanted to suggest? Question. Uh, Question first. Okay. If we're ready, if it's ready to be error in the second one, why do we need to like post condition? Yeah, it's a valid concern. Here's a concern you just mentioned. Uh, what's your name? Alan. Alan. Alan's concern was like this. Number three, we are checking to see whether a dot count is equal to o a dot count, right? However, you didn't check it before two. You can see when we check the blue one over here, when we check to see over here whether this particular cross loop should be satisfied, this particular array setup will already give you that contract violation for index invalid index. You will all, so what you're saying is, I will only check it over here when the violation already occurred. Seems to be out of order. So now, I put this intentionally. Okay. When we talk about post condition over there, let me just mention again, if you got post condition one, two, and three, they flow sequentially. The way Eiffel runtime check it is by checking one first. If one does not cause any violation, you go to number two. If number two does not cause any violation, you go to number three. Right? So now, Alan, save us. Anything we can do? Uh, I guess 
Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. So instead, I'm going to say this is not the right place to put it. I should really insert it over here. Maybe call that maybe 2.1. A dot count equals old A dot count. That's another thing you have to be uh, watching out. Yes. Oh, it's different. It's different. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Alan's concern was this. If I have the first version, like here, let me just go back here. If I only have that, right? What I can possibly end it up with is to say when we got to here, we'll get array, we might get array uh, invalid index violation. Okay, but that's not a very good error to tell the clients. You're basically telling your clients, I tried to run your service, but somehow I got into array out of bound exception. That's not a very good uh, error to signal. Okay, instead, it would be much nicer if we do the following. Okay, if I erase this one here and then insert it over here, I'll give a proper tag. Over here, I would say array size unchanged. And then over there, I would say a dot count equals old a dot count. Let's say for this particular fixed version. So now, if I try to run these three post conditions again, I'm going to fail this particular one. In that case, it's going to give me this particular error for tracing. So now it's much better. It tells me basically to say the supplier shouldn't have changed the uh, size of the array, but it has. Okay, it's a better error to report, basically. Okay. It's a very long discussion for this example, but I think it's worth spending the time because you're going to see this kind of pattern over and over. So it's really good to know both the predicates and also how to use a cross. Again, to use a cross programmatically, I'll give you more details on Friday. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Yes, I just forgot to put it. You're absolutely right. Thank you. So the question is, basically, if you did not have this particular tag, is it going to make a difference? Uh, it's only going to make a, the following difference. Let's say if you don't have this particular tag, you only get a dot count equals o a dot count, right? You've only got that. So that means when the same error occurred, it's only going to tell you this particular predicate failed to satisfy, rather than giving you this informative tag. So that's the difference. Okay. But so that's why I said it will be always nice to put some informative tag for the post condition or the precondition or even the class invariants. Okay. Okay. That's the final version. Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was only thinking about it particularly, but you're right, in general. Well, Jordan is making a very good point. Maybe somehow we just make A empty by the evil supplier, so that AI will definitely fail, right? So now the best place to put it would be, let me just fix it. That's good. Rather than here, I would just put it here. Let's call it zero, okay? I agree. Be very, very used to this kind of thinking. That's what's required for this course. You want to think about not just at the code level, but also think about all the possible scenarios between the client and the supplier. Right? Okay, any questions? You can definitely ask me later after you think about it. It takes some time. Okay? Any questions? Okay. What I promised you guys to do from last Wednesday is to really give you some concrete example why having contracts can be useful for guiding your developments. Okay. I will try to do within 20 minutes to at least talk about it, so you can keep that in mind and then try to apply that as you go for the course. Okay. Uh, let me just tell you the roadmap I'm going to do. Okay. It's a complete example. I also made the source code available to you okay, after today's class. Okay. 
and I'll run some demo on my computer to show you. This is how we're going to go for this particular example. Okay. Let's say we start with our developments, and then we have our version one of the developments, version one. Basically, conceptually, you can think about there is a client's C, conceptually. It's a, it doesn't have to be called clients. And then it is using another module or class called supplier, okay? client and supplier. Okay? In version number one, somehow the client is passing invalid input to the supplier. However, the supplier does not check if the input is valid or not, which means there's no contracts. There's no precondition, for example, for the supplier. So version number one is pretty bad, which means when things go wrong, no contract violation to tell you which side to blame. Okay, that's basically version number one. I'll give you more detail. I just want to talk about conceptually so you wouldn't get lost. Version number one. So to fix version one, what we want to do is we want to now say for the supplier to be fair to you, you better add some precondition to your API. Okay, so what, what we will do is we're going to evolve to version number two. Version number two for the developments, we still got clients and we still have supplier. Okay, we still have supplier. But now the extra thing we add to the, uh, will be to the supplier. The extra will be, so now we're going to add a precondition, for example. Add a precondition to the supplier. What would be the advantage for this? The advantage would be if the client is still trying to give you some invalid input as in version one, will we be able to know which side to blame? We will be, because now for the invalid input, you will definitely just trigger this particular precondition violation, so we would know which side to blame, the client to blame, because you don't satisfy the precondition. Okay? So this will be a violation. That will be as expected. In version number one, things just go wrong without any violation, which is pretty bad. There's no sign about things going wrong. Okay, for version number two, we know, so now the client knows that when they try to use service from the supplier, they are supposed to actually uh, satisfy their precondition. So we're not quite, there's no balance yet because it's, uh, at the moment, the client is not doing the right thing. So that's why we want to move to version number three. So when we move to version number three, we are still going to have our client and the supplier. Okay, let me just move a little bit further. I need some space. So now for version number three, we got clients and we got supplier, right? And now for the supplier, we still have that particular precondition. And now for the clients, it's also going to make sure it will always pass some valid input somehow. So now we are basically reaching a balance between the client and the supplier in this particular system, which means when the client is trying to use the supplier service, they always try to check if the input is valid. On the other hand, for the supplier, they always check to see when the service is called, the precondition is satisfied, right? It's both. So now we are basically, well, if you study economics, it's more like equilibrium, right? It's uh, like a balance state. Version number three is basically the version we want to get eventually, version number three. Up to now, we are just talking about developments, okay? Once now you're happy with both versions, well, once now you're, you're happy with this particular balanced version, stable version, what we can do now is to do the following. Well, now we are ready to shift the products. What we can do is we can finalize it by turning off all the contract because contract checking is not efficient. So, but when we are doing the developments, as you can see, precondition can help us to see which side to blame. So the clients will improve and the supply will improve as well. But once we're happy with the version that's stable, we can now turn off all the contract checking. They are not necessary anymore, okay? So once we finalize the uh, products, so now the external user or client can now use it and then they will expect to see something that's actually appropriate. Okay? That's kind of the uh, process I want to show you using a, a small but complete example. That's kind of the roadmap I want to go through. 
Okay? Of course, for this particular example, I only talk about preconditions, but the same principle applies to post condition, also class invariants. There are also other contracts. Okay? So the lesson to learn at the end of the day is you should really try to use pre, post condition, and class invariant to help your developments to see which side to blame. If the side is to be blamed, you want to improve that side, of course, before you can uh, shift the products. Okay, any question about the conceptual uh, roadmap over here? We're going to talk about exactly uh, the details, okay? okay? I'm going to use something you're very familiar with, binary search, okay? Let's say the supplier is going to provide binary search. The client is going to somehow supply some input array. Of course, the input array must be sorted, right? That's kind of the story I'm going to tell, okay? Uh, so let me now talk about uh, this particular thing, okay? Uh, don't worry about missing the notes. I'm going to post it anyway. So just make sure you can understand what's going on here. Okay. So now I'm going to illustrate to you on the, on the computer as well. Okay. Basically, uh, we're going to talk about some console application, and then you the user will just keep entering names, string names. And then all we want to do is we want to search to see if a name exists in the database. Let's say the database is very easy, just using an array to represent a database. And then uh, array and also binary search, right? Let me give you one example, okay? Eventually, what we really want to see is something like this, okay? Let me just minimize this, okay? Let me tell you eventually what we want to see, version number three, okay? When you run the code, you can definitely run it. I'm going to make it available to you. When you run this program here, you got to say either version one, version two, or version three. Let me tell you how version three should work, first of all, okay? So now let me run it. When you run the console application, you will say enter a name. I'll just make it very uh, symbolic. Let's say uh, E, C, D, A, and B. I'm done. So I'll just say done. It's a special word to tell the program I should now go to the next stage. So now it simply tells you that, oh, so far the input string you have entered is in this particular sorted order, A, B, C, D, E. So the client who is going to use a binary search is now behaving appropriately, okay? So now, I can now try to see if the name I uh, enter exists. For example, does A exist? It does exist. Does C exist? It does exist, for example. Well, what about F? It does not exist. So the program is now working fine. But this is only the ultimate version we will hope to get to. Let's see before that how the development should go to keep improving, okay? That's what I want to show you. So over here is only the final version, but let's see how the previous two versions look like, okay? So let me just quit from there. Okay, so now let's talk about the first version, okay? Uh, let me give you a little bit of idea about the first version, okay? Uh, for the first version here, um, when you uh, download the source code in iPad Studio, I do encourage you to try it out to see what's going on. So I already opened the iPad Studio, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, well, I wouldn't show you too many contents. When you expand the model cluster over here, you will see version one, version two, and version three, v1, v2, and v3, okay? If you expand, for example, the first version here, always you got, you got two classes, either database or you got utilities. You can think about the database is the clients who is going to use the utilities by the research, okay? So now, in version number one, the problem is this. When you go to utilities, you can see there is a command over there called search. That one implements binary search. So if you're wondering about basic syntax, you can also look at that. That will also help you, okay? So now, you can see the binary search over here. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Yes, I can. You can see for the search here, is there any stated obligation for the clients? No, there's no require which means as if required true. That means any input array over here that's passed, it will simply just be passed right away, right? So it's no guarantee whether A is sorted or not. On the other hand, that's about the supply. So supplier is actually wrong because it doesn't really sp uh, clearly specify what's the uh, obligation for the clients. On the other hand, if you go to the database over here, okay? A very simple database, it's not difficult. If you go to database, we simply got an array over here of type string. Um, okay, let me just go to database here. If you look at the database, you can see the data is an array of string. 
you want to make sure whenever you want to call the supplier for the binary search, our data itself better be sorted. If it is not sorted, you're gonna get some trouble. Let's look at version one. For version number one, you can see every time when we read a new name, it will simply do uh, data the force. By the way, force is actually quite a useful feature uh, to really insert to the end of the array. Okay, that's something you can also refer to the basic uh, syntax guidance. Okay, basically now we have the client has no intention to sort the array before they pass to the search. You can see that every time read a new name, they simply insert to the end, and then they will simply call u dot search. So now there's no guarantee whatsoever data will be sorted. Dep depends how the external user is using it, right? Let me illustrate to you, okay? However, what's really bad about this version here is when something that goes wrong, there will be no contract violation. There's no contract here. That's a problem, okay? So now, um, when, you, when you see the iPad note, that's exactly what I just said, okay? I'm, I'm not gonna read it, so you can read it later. Let me illustrate to you version number one. So now let me go to version number one, okay? So now what I will do is, I'm gonna invoke version number one, okay? So now I'm gonna enter the same sequence. So the, so the order in which I enter the string will be not sorted, okay? E, C, D, A, B, okay? E, C, D, A, B. Now I'm done. Now the client, the database basically tells me this is the array that's stored internally, E, C, D, A, B, not sorted. And then it's going to pass this array directly to the supplier for binary search. Apparently, it's going to be wrong, right? For example, for example, you can see over here, if I simply try whether A exists or not, it tells me A does not exist. A was there, but it does not exist. So that means the array is not sorted and you're trying to do binary search. You might just miss it. Is there any contract violation to tell me something has gone wrong? No. So the design in the first version is very poor. When things, goes, uh, when thing go, uh, when things go wrong, uh, it simply just cannot tell you. And then B here does not exist, C does not exist, and et cetera, right? However, it's very unpredictable. It tells me C does not exist, but D exists, right? It just goes wrong, very wrong. That's version one, any questions? How can we improve it? Let's try to improve on the supplier side because the main surface that's being used is the uh, binary search. So what I will do is I will improve the supplier to begin with, and let's see what happened. So if you go to version number two, okay, what you will see is some precondition over there. I'll show you how the precondition looks like. If you look at the source code, I'll just go over on the iPad here together with you quickly, okay? That's also some nice case study for the across loop, okay? So now you can see for the binary search on the supplier side, in version number two, right? We talk, we talk about version number two. Okay, we are trying to improve it. Now we, under the require, we basically got, this is the tag of the precondition. And we are trying to do across, and then we want to make sure across all, every element in the array is sorted, okay? I might talk about this a little bit later, but this definitely corresponds to the following in predicates. I'll just show you quickly, okay? You can study that. For every i such that a dot lower, which is the minimum index, you can assume it's always one, unless otherwise told, okay? a dot lower less than or equal to one, less than or equal to a dot upper, however, here I say minus one, which is very important, okay? It is the case, a i, is less than, strictly less than a, i plus one. That's how you check to see whether the array is sorted, right? We're basically checking every adjacent indices, for example here, let's say this. When i is equal to one, make sure this is sorted, right? When i is equal to two, make sure this is sorted. When i is equal to three, make sure this is sorted, right, Etc. When i is equal to four, do I have to make sure it's sorted in this way? No, because I'll go out of boundary. So that's why it should be a dot upper minus one. Okay, just very quick. Okay, overall, it's definitely an improvement for the supplier side, because now we do have a proper precondition to tell, if you wanna use my binary search, you better sort the array before you pass it to me. Okay, let's see what happened. Now we definitely will signal something 
something, some error to the client side, and then hopefully that will force them to improve. Otherwise, the whole application will just crash. So now let me go to, uh, let me quit the previous version. Let me now go to version two. Okay, I will do the same. E C D A B. Okay, E C D A B, and then done. So you can see now the database side, the uh, clients has not improved, right? They still haven't sorted the array yet. So E C D A B. So now, if I try the following, when the uh, if I say uh, whether A exists or not, th as soon as I hit enter, it's gonna trigger the calling of the binary search by using this particular unsorted input array over here. And what's gonna happen? Is it gonna be silent or something is gonna signal the error? Precondition violation, right? agree? Okay, so now if I say A here, okay, it's a little bit, uh, okay, you can see, it's an array sorted precondition violation violated. This is very valuable because now when you're trying to use your system by combining different classes, now it tells you something wrong when you combine them together. And the, the side to be blamed will be the clients because they call, they violate the precondition for binary search. Okay, that's version number two. Version number two is not so perfect just yet because your application simply just crash, right? That's not good, you cannot finalize yet. So now finally, to go to the final version, you have to improve the client side. You can see initial, from version number one, no contracts. Nobody's being forced to do anything. So things might just go wrong and things stay silent, which is pretty bad. Version number two, we did the supplier properly. So now clients will be forced to do something to make sure the array is sorted. I did a very uh, naive way. Okay. So now if you look at the code over there, I'll show you very quickly. If you go back to iPhone Studio over there, and then you go to version number three, okay? V3, and then go to uh, database version number three. You will see that basically, now, every time I want to add a new name into the array, I'll make sure I insert it into the right place so that the array remains to be sorted. It's basically what you would do in an insertion sort, okay? I'll just mention that quickly. But again, you can definitely look at the code and to uh, study that, okay? So that's the only change. So now that will make sure when I call this particular search now, unlike version one and version two, data will, will be guaranteed to be sorted. And this only happened after we have seen the precondition violation. So it's forced to do so, okay? So now version number three. Okay, so now let's see very quickly. Okay, so now for version number three, everything will just work. Basically, I already illustrated that. E, C, D, A, B. So now, it can, if I say done, you can see now the input array that's going to be passed for binary search is also sorted, right? So now the clients supply, they are forced to reach this stable state, okay? Now, for example, A exists, B exists, E does not, uh, E exists. Yes, exactly, E is there. What if I say F does not exist, right, et cetera. That's the final version. So now we basically have some very well behaved client and supplier, and now the precondition will not be necessary anymore because the clients, the database is always trying to sort the array. So for all the occasions that you might call the binary search, it's guaranteed to be safe. So you can turn off the precondition. Okay. Um, I think Alan was the one who originally got some concern. Do you think that might more or less address your concern? I hope, more or less, okay. But I would say, uh, try to get, uh, get some lesson from this particular example. Number one, when you do your software development, you cannot just have one single version. You have to evolve your system into different versions. That's number one. Number two, how can you improve from version to version? Your best bet is to gradually add appropriate contracts, pre and post condition to the supplier and also client classes so that if you can actually uh, test all the use cases without having any contract violation, that means you're now stable. You can then finalize, okay? Okay, so I got about maybe 10 minutes uh, left. I would like to go to a new lecture quickly just to introduce a new concept. Again, for Friday, I will tell you about across uh, more thoroughly, okay? Okay, so now I would like to go to the new lecture. 
one more thing to mention. So uh, for the DBC lecture that we have talked about in the previous two or three classes, you want to make sure go to the end, and then you will see the tutorial videos for, uh, you know, for Eiffel syntax. I will, again, I highly recommend you do it. Okay, it's gonna help you. Okay, so now let's talk about this quickly. We'll see what we can do in ten minutes. Okay. This lecture here is basically going to show you how you can really try to do proper post condition. As I mentioned before, post condition is actually more challenged to write than precondition because you have to worry about in the pre states and the post states and how are the attributes related in between these two states. Okay, but we're gonna see. Okay, but I want to build uh, build some basics into you. Okay, you want to know number one how to do some do copying of objects, either do shallow copy, reference copy, or deep copy. Number one issue number one. Number two. How exactly do you use the old keyword in iPhone? That's also very important. But for today, hopefully, I can just explain to you how to do the three kinds of copies to begin with. Okay, let's see how much you can do. Okay, let's now start uh, copying objects. Okay, let's say we have the following setup. Okay, uh, conceptually. So basically, got two objects over here. The first object, uh, both are of type C. That's why you can see for the title of the bot, I say C here, okay? Let's say there's, excuse me, there's only one attribute in class C, which is called A. A can be arbitrarily complicated, so that's why I'm just pointing to some cloud, C1.A, okay? And then I'm saying I have two objects of the same type. I got C1 and I got C2, okay? Just make sure you understand that. I wanna explain conceptually first before we move on to a more concrete example. Let's say we got these two objects. We want to know exactly how we may copy objects over. Let's say what kind of copy we can make out of C2 and then assign that to C1. That's basically what I want to show. There are three possibilities. The first one is the easiest one, but you know, let's just see. Uh, that might be nice to review a little bit about object orientation um, if you have forgotten about it. Okay, so now the first one, that one there is the easy one, easiest one and the cheapest one. Cheapest in the sense in the sense that you wouldn't take you wouldn't take so much computation to achieve it. Okay? So now let's say I got C1 here, I got C2 here. Now uh, remember in IFO, call and equal means assignments, variable assignments, right? If I say C1 is assigned to C2, what exactly am I doing here? Do I, okay, first of all, do I need to create any new objects? I don't have to, right? Good. So now, basically what I'm trying to say is, C2 stores the address of this object here. C1 stores the address of this object here. Now, I want to assign whatever address that is stored in C2 into C1, right? So that means, should I change the arrow of C1 well, should I change the arrow of C2? C1, thank you. So now C1, rather than pointing to here, is now only going to point to here. Agree? This is very cheap because all you do is copy address over into a single variable. No new object is going to be created, no. Okay, that's a reference copy. That's what you learned uh, in the previous OO courses. Okay, that was easy. I want to talk about a second one here. The second one is called shallow copy. Shallow copy does a little bit more. Okay? Basically, what a shallow copy does, eventually we want to assign something to C1, eventually. Okay? But now, how do we compute C2.twin? Okay? Unlike the previous case where no new objects created, for C2.twin, first of all, you're going to create a new objects. Okay? What I will do is I'm going to create a new object over here, just a new object. And the object is of type C, okay? Just the same as C2. And then every C object has an attribute called A, okay? This is so-called the first level copy in the sense that now, in order for me to copy further, I have a decision to make. Do I have to duplicate the whole cloud? Okay, that's a decision I have to make. If I have to duplicate the whole cloud in order for this particular attribute A to store, that would be computationally too complex because 
C2 dot A over here might contain you know, very recursive structure, let's say for the heap or binding research tree, right? Can be very difficult, okay? So now, the first level copy simply says, once you have created this new object here, basically, let's say, uh, let me just call this, let's say C2 twin, okay? Let, that's hidden, okay? C2 twin is the new object I'm trying to uh, create. And then, I'll say C2 twin dot A, which is referring to this. That one there should be assigned to C2 dot A. So, first level copy simply means you do the reference copy for every attribute of the object you are trying to create. You don't do anything further, okay? So now, what that will do is, it's now going to say C2 twin dot A is now going to just point to the same cloud. So you can see C2 dot A is not really duplicated. That's about how you create a twin, the shallow copy. After that, you're going to assign the whole thing into C1. And that one over there will just be a reference copy, right? So now C1 there, rather than pointing to here, is now going to point to this particular object. Okay? That's the whole thing, right? Let me just highlight it quickly. And then I'll ask you a few questions to verify. So now C1 is now pointing to this particular new object here, first of all. However, at the level of its attributes is still pointing to the object that's aliased from the original C2.A. Okay, that's shallow copy. Okay, a few things to check with you, okay? If I go back to the reference copy here, okay? If I do the following, if I say, after this particular um, copy, right? After C1 is assigned to C2, if I say C1 equals C2, and in Eiffel, this means comparing their address, right? Should this be true or false? True, okay, very good. And now, C1.A equals C2.A. True or false? True, agree? C1 is now pointing to this particular object. C2 is now pointing to the same object. Of course, they're A referring to the same cloud, right? That would just be true. Okay, important to see. What about the shallow copy here? Let's say the shallow copy. If I say, for example, if I say C1 equals C2, oh, sorry, let me see that again. Let's compare the twin version of C2, okay? Let's compare these two versions. If I say C2 equals C2 dot twin, true or false? False, because we are referring to two different objects over here, so that'll be false, right? Oh, sorry, false. That one is there is different from true in the case of reference copy. On the other hand, if we try to compare their first level object, uh, attributes, if I say c2.a equals c2.twin.a, is it true or false? True, good, because now you can see c2.twin.a is over here, and then it's now going to point to the same cloud, right? As C2.A, which is also pointing to this cloud here. Okay, that'll be true. Notice the difference, okay? So now let's now go to the extreme. I just need two more minutes, okay? Let's go to the extreme to do the third kind of copy, which is deep copy. How do we do deep copy? In some way, shallow copy might be the more difficult one to really understand because it's only, it stopped at some point, only at the first level. For reference copy, it's easy, just copy the address. For uh, deep copy, you will simply do duplicate the object basically recursively, okay? So now, I'm gonna do c2.deepTwin. So deepTwin is actually something you can call on the objects on iPhone, okay? So what I would do is, let's say we got c2 and also deepTwin. Let's say we're gonna sum this uh, implicit variable. What that will do is, it's now going to create a new object over here, c, and now a, it's not going to point to the same cloud anymore. What they will do is, they are going to recursively create a different cloud over here. Think about, it's just going to be a different cloud. That's gonna be a deep copy of C2.A, different objects. And then, it's now going to point to over here. That's a deep twin, which means after the deep twin, it's computationally expensive, but it does have some advantage when we do the post-condition writing. But we'll see that on Monday, but not just, give me one minute, okay? So now after this, when you say C1 is assigned to that, 
the C1 is now going to point to this particular object. Okay? One final check for you, okay? Then I'll let you go. If I say, for example, C2 equals C2 deep twin. True or false? False, right? Different objects over here, right? You'll be false. And then if I say C2.A, which is referring to this cloud over here, equals C2 deep twin. Dot A. True or false? False, because it's now referring to this particular cloud. It's also false. Okay? Before Monday, refer, uh, review this concept about the three kinds of copy. I know, go from there. Okay?